Welcome guys and gals. This is your host, Frog Prince Rana. And thank you for dropping by. This is a video I had in the pipeline for months. And the hardest decision for me was to choose on what I should really be focusing on this video. Should it be how YouTubers shilling for various corporation, often not even understanding what they are promoting? Or should it be on the corporations that uses various myth and influencers to push their product? Or should it be on the actual privacy and security? It was a tough call for me. There are many such product placements on various social media by influencers, from headphone to web design. I will just mention one product on a field that I know a little bit about, VPN. We have all heard about it. We have seen countless advertisements and this is supposed to be the end all answer for all our security privacy questions. Well, is it? Let's start with basic communication. Suppose I open my browser and type in www.google.com. Well, first the browser would translate that domain name to an actual numerical address. If this value is not cached, browser would query a DNS server on port 53. After resolving the address, when the actual request is passed to my router, which keeps a track of which computer this request was made from, then my router passes this request to my ISP through ISP router. If that site IP address is blocked by my government, I would get a page that says access to this page is blocked by Virgin. Otherwise, Virgin would allow this query. Response to this request comes back to my router, which knows which computer made the actual request and passes that response to that computer. Obviously, from my ISP to my final destination, the query would jump through various different network. These are called hop. Each hop do have details of the source request, i.e. my address, final address, route taken and such with actual data request, which can be login details after clicking submit on any site among other sensitive data. Now that is in essence a normal internet routing. Now let's see what the claims are. First claim is bypassing geo access. Yes. This is a valid claim. Now suppose I want to access that blocked site that is blocked by my ISP. Well, maybe a different provider wouldn't block it. When I was in China, I couldn't access Google services as my local provider had blocked access to it. At times, it can be blocked by region, like a certain show is only available in specific countries. I'm pretty sure parts of BBC is blocked when I'm away from UK. With a VPN in place, well, you still have ISP providing the connection, but all your real request is now handled by your VPN provider. This request is also encrypted. Now, what does that mean? Well, for blocked sites in UK, Virgin doesn't know that I'm trying to access those sites. All it knows that I'm passing some data to a non-blocked IP address. Now it's that connection that is requesting the resource. If that connection is originating from Spain, well then to the rest of the world, those requests are coming from Spain. So if a show is blocked in your country and allowed from another, all you need is a way to request that show from an allowed country, aka a VPN or virtual private networking. So yes, we spoof our originating country and access any resources blocked by that specific rule. Next claim. Well, I have seen it on a very popular wrestling channel that I am subscribed to and do enjoy the content. At one of this ad reading, the host actually said something paraphrasing to VPN secures all the communication, like when you are doing your online banking. While technically not incorrect, I do take objection to that statement. Let's rewind a bit. As a programmer, I do have enough expertise to set up a system 
where I can monitor and log all data going in and out of my router. I can do the same thing with a wireless router and make it publicly available without any password like a honeypot. Now, when it comes to communication, we have two types, secure and not secure. In the secure method, every communication data is encrypted in such a way that in theory, only the receiver could understand it. There is some absolutely beautiful math that secures it all for us. Meanwhile, when you type your banking credential, the value that passes from your computer starts encrypted. So regardless how many hops it encounters or someone logging all the communication, in theory, all they have is a lot of data that should take many lifetimes to decrypt. So all my logging data that has used secure channel is really unusable. What happens when it is not using the security? Well, that is what we call plain text. If you sniff the packets for web or email communication, you see the password as clear as day. Maybe it will be base64 encoded, which really means nothing. Couple of years ago, Apple made a change in their iOS, where mobile apps were not allowed to connect to a non-secure site. Any recent website should automatically redirect you to a secure site, even if you typed in without the S in HTTPS. This is a simple web routing rule supported by all web servers. So when you connect your online banking, it should automatically force you into secure. But suppose it didn't. Then, from the sniffing or man-in-the-middle attack perspective, well, suppose you connect to my wireless network. Well, in that case, I will have all your credentials. What happens if you connect to my wireless and then use a VPN? Well, the communication between you and VPN is secure, so I would get garbled data. But the site you have requested is still insecure, which means if VPN was logging the data, your credential would be visible there. Basically, what I'm saying is, if the site you're connecting to is already HTTPS, then VPN or no VPN doesn't mean anything as long as it comes to security, except from making it slower due to additional hop. Thus, technically it is correct, as it would stop my man-in-the-middle attack, only if you're stupid enough to use non-secure site. There is a free extension I use called HTTPS Everywhere, Basically, it forces a secure connection even if I didn't type it so. I do recommend installing it. Next claim is, VPN will protect your privacy. Well, this claim I will seriously disagree with. Allow me to explain the wonderful world of fingerprinting. Let's start with your browser. There are certain values a website can request about your computer. Well, to give it a personalized look, for example, if we know that default language is French, we can perhaps have the default site in French instead of English. Now, obviously, millions of people would have the same default language. But the more data points you have, the narrower or more personalized this fingerprint gets. There are many parts in your computer that has a unique ID. The most commonly used one is MAC address in your network card. It might be a wireless or wired. In any case, it would have an address different than all other network card address in the world. In theory, a browser should not allow a site to request this information. In practice, browser is running with enough privilege to request that information from your computer. And badly written browser or a bug in the code can leak that seriously unique code outside and that would be a perfect fingerprint data. Most of the tracking on internet is done by two companies. Guess who those entities are? We have Google and Facebook. So how does this work? Well, most websites using these services would call up a script from the provider server. May that be Google or Facebook. The provider would then create a hash from selected 
browser data fingerprint and store it on server side. At this point, a cookie may also be stored in your browser that would work like a relay. To start with, when Google or Facebook can identify your browser fingerprint, that can obviously shared and used for advertisement. And our precious privacy is out of the way. It doesn't matter if you use VPN or not, as IP address and geolocation is additional data on top of the fingerprint. Think logically. A user may travel around with his or her laptop. If the tracking was hard-coded with geolocation, it would be pretty useless as the user is moving around. This fingerprint does not care about your IP or location. What happens if you change a system component that changes this fingerprint value? This is where the relay cookie comes in. It is basically used to hand over the new fingerprint replacing the old value. Do remember that the fingerprint is stored on some server and not on your computer. Just to give some idea on the data, a website can get a list of all the fonts installed on my computer. Now, apart from the default fonts, there are some specific fonts that I have personally installed. Meaning, I just made that list a little bit more unique than generic. Then a list of all the plugins I have installed. It even knows that my backslash key types out the hash sign. Some audio device and WebGL data are also used. Maybe this is a place to point out. Getting an invalid response is still a response and a data point. To give an example, one browser that I will soon talk about disables WebGL query and returns invalid type. Now this result itself is a data point indicating what browser this might be. While in incognito mode, well, the most important feature of incognito or private mode is no cookies or cache is stored between browser sessions. Meaning, while you have the browser open, all cookies are saved and shared when applicable. But the moment you restart the browser, all those data are lost or erased. This stops any relay mechanism in place. But if the browser is leaking enough data points, it can still be possible to have a uniqueness value. Even if the data is not enough for true uniqueness, it still groups the data into neat containers. And additional data points like user logging into Google Mail or Facebook and location can further increase this uniqueness. What does that all mean? Well, pray that Chrome or other browser is never disclosing truly unique values to the outside world, either deliberately or by mistake, and that the data it's leaking is not enough to truly identify you. And does VPN fit into this scenario anywhere? Well, no, it does not. Does it contribute to privacy in any way? Not really. In a single incognito session, if you open up a tab and log into Facebook, all other tabs in that session would have access to that uniqueness. Meaning, if my site was using Facebook service, I could then get more information on you the moment you came to my site. Now, is that really protecting your privacy? VPN does nothing here. Final claim is the trust issue. We are meant to trust that they are not logging our data and will not hand it out to third party. Most of them are very vague about this issue. My point might be easier to explain with an example. If I open a bank at my home, would you deposit money in it? If not, why? I'm sure your answer would ultimately come down to trust. That trust might be achieved by being backed by a government you trust. It might be achieved by having a long track record in banking. To me, the exact reasoning applies. As they are making all the requests, if we are using encryption throughout all types of communication, they will not have the actual data. But a list of communications with exact time and destination IP address. So. How are those data secure? How does VPN establishes this trust? 
well initially simply by claiming so and then use influencers those we trust to read out a blurb that we should trust vpn providers as they store no such log i remember at least three providers off the top of my head who claimed zero log and they were caught having such data and passing it to government authorities these are pure vpn ip vanish and hide my ass apart from just claiming some vpn companies did get third party audit done couple of those i remember are express vpn nord vpn viper vpn and such can i just say something here as a programmer who has audited other security system and has his system audited by third party there are two types of audit i have experience with in this context which are to tell us how secure the system is and if it is doing what it is supposed to do first is a pure software or vulnerability audit i like this no human interaction needed all results can be repeated and verified for example we check for a vulnerability called sql injection and it succeeds we can repeat that and use it to fix the bug next is the infrastructure audit this can be walking around the office to notice any sticky note containing passwords looking at waste bin to see if any useful data can be gleaned checking out servers in use even talking to people and ask them questions if anyone has seen sergeant bilko would know what i'm getting at it is better than nothing but when it comes to an audit like this the auditor do require complete cooperation from the company if the auditor is not told of xyz server there is a very good chance that they would not know about xyz server personally i don't hold an infrastructure audit to a high value also this is just a summary i can make this an hour video just talking about audit but seriously no one wants that i do have something good to say for express vpn though in december 2017 turkish police attempted to force express vpn to provide customer data for a criminal investigation following express vpn statement that they did not have any logs to provide their server in a turkish data center was physically seized even then it did not reveal any information as there was no logs nord vpn on the other hand had a breach at march 2018 that took over a year to detect that was mixture of mistakes by many different parties so nord vpn was not completely at blame though when i read the original statement i felt they were trying to negate the actual hack and glossing over what the hack can be used for i'm not advocating one vpn over the other personally if i have to use one i would go with mozilla vpn simply because of the trust factor that name mozilla brings to me i have been using the open source browser for over 24 years and later their email client mozilla project was created in 1998 with the release of netscape browser suite source code in 2003 The Mozilla project created the Mozilla Foundation, an independent non-profit organization supported by individual donors and a variety of companies. Their VPN service just came out of beta. Currently, it does not have nowhere near the server count of all the competitors and not as much functionality. But for me, that trust factor is more than what these missing features are worth. There is no affiliate link. My video is about understanding security, what they claim to do and what they actually might do. If your use case does not care about the logging and all you do is watch geo-locked content, then maybe the cheapest option is correct for you. Then again, if you're a journalist or oppressed group under a brutal regime like China, Well, you might want something a bit more secure. Your use case, your money, your choice. Leave me out of it. Well, that is all the bitching I have about VPN. Now, those YouTubers who peddle VPN, 
Well, maybe they don't know enough about computer security. Or maybe they know a lot more than me and thinks it's not a big deal. Who knows? Recently, a bunch of app got into trouble because they were using an undocumented feature to get unique ID from mobile device, similar to browser, that was a value they were not supposed to get. Oh well, that is what we programmers call an oopsie. By the way, I do have two other security videos that you might want to check out. Links would be in description. Those VPN providers, well, they know what the deal is. But from marketing perspective, what is the motivation for them to spell this out, right? There is Tor Network. Now Tor is synonymous with dark web or deep web, but it is also a good privacy option. Remember earlier with a normal browser or even with a VPN, every hop it made from the requesting server to final destination, each has details on source, destination and so on. Tor in simple terms divides the whole hop into three groups. First is entry node, final one is exit node and all the hops in middle are middle relay. The data is encrypted and passed in such a way that those relays only know the previous address and next address in route. Entry or guard relay is the one that knows your actual IP address. An exit relay is the node that appears to the site as the origin address. Back to our starting point, what is the solution? Well, it depends. What is the question? Well, whatever it is, Always use HTTPS when browsing. Moving on. Do you want to get less advertisements based on your tracking habit? Well, you can always switch on do not track option in your browser and hope that website honors that request. You can put an ad blocker. I have a local DNS system to block adverts. So I don't have to install ad blocker extension on every single browser in every single device. If there is demand, I'll release a video on that. Going around geo-blocking, VPN is the answer. But please, don't completely rely on it to hide your browsing activity. With correct fingerprint, you can still be tracked and analyzed for advertisement purposes. Tor is quite slow compared to other method. But just for pure anonymity, this is more secure than VPN, but we still have our fingerprint. It is in a way similar to virus antivirus fight. These big companies would try to find their way around these limits. And if you're big enough like Facebook, you can even get Apple to withheld their anti-ad tracking feature for a while. When it comes to fingerprint, honestly, I don't see Chrome to ever push the privacy protection to its limit. Google has no motivation behind that. There are some browsers that are trying out various techniques. The one that I'm using right now alongside my main browser is called Brave. Let me back up a bit. I have three browsers installed. Well, one came with the damn OS. Firefox is now my safe browser. Important stuff like banking and such is on this browser. No password is saved. Then I have Edge. Only in a blue moon if I have to get on Facebook. That is the browser. Finally, for day-to-day -day browsing, I'm using Brave. Before I was using the same Firefox. Brave is based on open source Chromium. And one of the neat features of this browser is randomizing or limiting some of the browser information. It starts simple. Instead of specifying that a user prefers Australian English or British English, the browser might just report English in order to reduce how identifying a language preference is. Brave then applies randomization-based protection to canvas and web audio-based fingerprinting. This option is called Farbling. I have added some links in description that you can check your browser fingerprint uniqueness. Well, this is where I'll end this video. Hopefully it has been informative 
and would help you decide and understand all the claims. If you have enjoyed this content, please like, comment, share and such. If you could also subscribe, it would help this channel grow. Full disclosure though, most of my content is debunking bad science and security videos like this are few and far in between. Wherever you are, have a safe day, signing off.